Welcome to another episode of the Writing Expensive Words podcast. If you're listening in, awesome. If you're watching on YouTube or on Instagram, you can write in live and ask me questions. Today, on today's episode, we are going to be talking about, (laughs) of course, like a million pop-ups come on my screen right now. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about why you can't write your way out of a gimmick without extensive rewrites. Uh, And the reason that we're talking about this is because we've been learning about gimmick writing and story ideas. And I don't know about you, but I absolutely hate with a passion rewrites. I can't stand them. Like, I don't want to do them anymore. There's like one more series where I've agreed to do it. And then I'm never doing it again. Um, And the thing is, if you have a gimmick, a lot of authors are like, hey, I can just edit this. It's no big deal, right? I can always make this work later. It's like in um, in like the film industry when you're like, oh, I'll get it in post, right? And then the everyone, all the editors are sitting around cringing because they know that that means that they're going to have to work like three times as many hours and that it's not going to be as good as it could be. And you want to get it as good as it can be on the first take in filming and also in writing. So uh, if you are like, Kristen, I have a good story idea and you can't think about the beginning, the middle, the end and how the character needs to change and what will help them change, you probably have a gimmick and you need to find before you start writing, if you want to avoid extensive rewrites, which I do. And I can't, like, any time I have to tell someone that they have to rewrite something, they get this look of, like, panic and then despair on their face. So I I have not met anyone who likes rewriting, except for the rare successful discovery writer, which that's a whole nother topic. I could do a whole show on it. But if you don't know what discovery writing is, it's when someone is a pantser instead of a planner, and they don't actually know what they're going to write about until they write it. And then they have to go back and do extensive rewrites, and they're fine with it. Uh, Margaret Atwood is like that, where she will just like write to discover in like all different perspectives, and it works for her. But in my experience, working with clients and for myself, it doesn't work well for most people. And planning is a much smoother route to go, especially if you want to avoid gimmick writing. So let's get into the first topic of today, gimmick writing meaning, because we need to talk about what this is before we can talk about how to avoid it. So a lot of writers want to know the difference between a story gimmick and a story idea. But the truth is that a story idea can easily be a gimmick. Uh, In fact, when gimmicks start out as story ideas and then stop there, if you've been taught that a story idea is the most important thing, then the person who taught you that doesn't know what they're talking about. Oh, maybe that's a little harsh, but it's true because a lot of what makes up a story gimmick is an effort to shock and trick the reader, which readers do not like. So for example, uh, last week I read The Waning Age uh, by S.C. Grace. Is that right? I can't look it up because I will be super distracted. You know, I'll just look it up really quick. Real quick. Let's see. The Waning Age. Because I want to get this right. Because this book was S.E. Groove. See, that's why you look things up because... The brain doesn't hold all the information. That's why you need to keep notes when you're working on your project. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, So The Waning Age by S.E. Grove, which the tagline, can I see the tagline? Let me look at the cover. In a world where only the rich can afford emotions, what is the cost of love? And I was like, oh, no, that sounds too good to be a fully developed story idea. It sounds like it's probably a gimmick. But then I did the test that I always do. And uh, if you've been listening to the show for any amount of time, you know my test. I go through and I read the first three pages. I don't read the synopsis anymore because I don't want the story to be ruined for me. And I know exactly what language they're going to use. And I know exactly how they're going to write it. So for me, the proof in the pudding, which is an American idiom, by the way, which I don't even understand, is that it means that the, the way that you can tell whether or not something is real 
is by doing this. And so the way that I can tell whether or not a writer is good is by reading their first three pages, because guess what? someone, you behave as well as you possibly can. And that is what writers should do or should be doing on their first few pages. So I started reading the first three pages and I was like, dang, okay, there's no any kind of um, story killers, which if you've taken any of my courses, you know, story staples are like consistency, consistent tense, uh, no head hopping. Like there were no warnings to tell me this author doesn't know what they're doing. So I went and I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, it is a fully felt, fully developed story idea. Um, I, I went and then looked at reviews and they were not very, they were not good. Like people were confused because the author, I think, assumed a level of intelligence on the reader's part, which I appreciated that she didn't have to spell everything out exactly because she used one of the characters to show that things are not exactly as they seem regarding losing your emotions. Um, but some people did not get it and they got mad. <laughs> so, you know, you have to balance these things out when you're writing. But uh, for me, I was like, yes, I'm glad you didn't have to spell things out. I would have been okay actually if um, she had spelled them out the author, but uh a lot of people were not okay with the fact that she didn't spell it out and they thought it was a gimmick and they got mad. So even if someone thinks something is a gimmick and it's actually not, they will still get mad. But in my case, I really enjoyed the book. I highly recommend it. I'm definitely going to do a review on it because it is a perfect example of how to fully develop a story so that it is not a gimmick, even though the idea seems new and shocking in a good way. And of course, I'll also say how she could have fixed the book to address the um, reader anger, the response that happened. Uh, but, you know, maybe she was okay with that happening. Sometimes you have to balance, you, you have to make those choices as an author. And also there was no way she could have known probably that readers would react that way because all the people that she thanked for reading the first draft were probably like really uh, advanced educationally. So, you know, that's why we test. That's why we have alpha and beta readers, but not paid. And but publishing houses don't tend to do that before they get ready. Like they just do all the work and then they send it out and they're like, boom, what's going to happen? And that is also something that I do. <laughs> but I have a like a little adjustment period because I'm self-published. So I can like put it out in this one sphere, see how readers react and then adjust. And that's normally what I do. OK, so uh, gimmicks happen, right? We need to define what a gimmick is still. Gimmicks happen when nothing real can take place or the story idea sounds totally unrealistic. And we'll keep going with uh, the waning age as an example, because the premise of the story is that when you turn a certain age, uh, let's say 10 is like the main age, that you start to lose your emotions and then you lose them completely. And if you're, if you're listening, I put completely in um, scare quotes, <laughs> because there's there are complications there. So, um, you know, you have the protagonist reacting to things and you're like, well, if emotions don't exist, why would she be reacting this way? And the author is very good at explaining and is able to carry through everything that needs to happen. But if she hadn't, this could very easily be a story that is based on a gimmick. So. You avoid gimmicks by asking yourself these questions. Can I put a realistic character in the story that can undergo realistic changes? If the answer is yes, then you probably don't have a gimmick, but you need to keep going to develop it into a fully fleshed out story idea that can carry you, like I said, from the beginning through the middle to the end and have the character make all of those changes. Okay, topic number two. Writing gimmicky characters. Okay, this is a big one because I know that for we authors, we writers, that it is like giving birth to a fictional character. And I have actually given birth to three human people. So uh, I understand that it's not the same, but you get attached to these characters, right? You feel like I am invested in the fact that I have created this fictional being. Um, so 
it can feel scary when you're writing a character because you're like, I don't want to write a gimmicky character. I don't want to create a character who annoys people. Unless you do like Jane Austen's Emma, which I have never been able to actually get through the book. I've watched the movie. I've read three quarters of the way through the book. And I'm just like, I don't even care. I don't care what the payoff is at this point. She's too annoying. <laughs> but Jane Austen did it on purpose. But that created a um, extreme reader response in me and I'm sure in other readers as well. So if you don't want to write a gimmicky character, if you don't want to be Jane Austen and push up against all the reader expectations, then you need to ask yourself a couple more questions. It's always asking questions, right? We're always thinking about these things um, in a very, uh, oh, I can't think of the word. It's gone. I can't. It just went away. Sometimes that happens to me. If you've ever tried to learn a second language, you know that like words leave your brain, like sometimes permanently. And then you're like, but it definitely happens like when you're talking. Um, so we need to think about all of these questions in a philosophical way. That's not the word I was looking for, but if it works here. Okay. So, um, it's really scary when you put this character out and you think, I might not have a good reader reception to this character. So this is what you do. This is the trick. This is the, if you, if all you listen to is this next part in this episode, it will have been worth your time, I promise. Um, so decide from the beginning of your story how your character will grow uh, in order to be at the place where they're going to be at the end of the story. And that is a the character arc match the plot. <laughs> you need it so that the character grows in a way so that when the resolution comes and the final plot point happens and things are resolved, that it makes sense to the reader. And that is very satisfying for the reader. So you need to be able to give them real challenges and real emotions. And if you do that, your character, your reader will be able to relate to the character. No problem. You don't have to stress. You don't have to worry about your character baby at that point anymore. Woo. Don't you feel better now? Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> Breathe in all the anxiety. <sighs> Breathe out the, well, I guess you're breathing out the anxiety too. <laughs> because you're like, I don't have to worry about this anymore. Awesome. Okay. So don't be lazy, be brave, stick to your plan that you have for the character, and you will not end up with a gimmicky character. Boom. All right. Today's third topic, gimmick definition. Okay, so I know we like to find what gimmick writing means, but let's talk about gimmicks in general, because that will help us understand how to apply these ideas to our writing. In a world of storytelling, when you hear the word gimmick, it is appropriate to cringe, right? Uh, a gimmick is when you try to lure the reader in with a truly intriguing story premise that you cannot deliver on. <laughs> That's the bummer, right? And so when you have a story idea that you fully developed with, remember, realistic feelings, realistic challenges, then you can celebrate because it means that you have not created a gimmick. So a gimmick a gimmick definition is when you try to lure someone in with the promise of something spectacular that you cannot possibly deliver on. All right, that one went quick. Now let's move to point number four. Okay. Got to flip my little pagey page here. What is a literary gimmick? So now we're taking the broad idea of a gimmick and a writing gimmick, and we're talking about a literary gimmick, which, you know, literary symmetry, right, is the name of my editing co-op. Who sponsors this show, by the way? If you are in need of any kind of storytelling assistance, we can help you out, literarysymmetry.com, and there's all kinds of great stuff on there. There's free stuff. All the courses just came out. Oh, I forgot to tell you, write fewer words, tell better stories is out, it's live. If you go to literarysymmetry.com, you will see it. Or if you want to go straight to the book, literarysymmetry.com forward slash machine. Um, so that's how it will help you with all your storytelling needs. Let's get back into what a literary gimmick is. 
Okay, there are writing gurus out there who will tell you that if you have a completely original idea, that that's where all your money is. That's where your fame and fortune is going to come in. But that's not true. Because if you cannot develop an idea, that means that you are going to make the reader mad. But there are some like especially offensive literary gimmicks out there. Uh, and there's no way you could follow through. So let's talk about what those are in point number five. Can, oh, uh, examples of literary gimmicks. So have you ever heard of people doing strange things to get book sales? This is the kind of gimmicky uh, writing guru stuff that I'm talking about. So for example, some people will be like, I'm going to write a book without the letter E. Why? Why? What could that possibly do that's good for you or the reader? First of all, it's going to create a lot of confusion because you can't be concise when you don't have the full variety of the amazingness that is the English language at your disposal. And the reasoning behind it, because I don't want to use the letter E, like I want to challenge myself. No, the whole point of writing is to communicate in a clear, concise way so that the reader understands. So no, don't do that. Another example is, um, so that would be called, I would say that's gimmicky writing. Uh, also, anytime you're trying to actively distract the reader and a lot of literary gimmicks are like, I'm writing in this weird way that uh, you don't know who the protagonist is and none of the characters have names or the characters all have numbers as names. Don't do that, that's confusing. You need to make sure that you're not actively trying to distract the reader from the story. They're there to go on the story journey with you. Remember, that's why they're there. That's why they've invested both their time and their money. So don't make the reader work too hard. That is just like a great rule. That's a great thing to remember. You don't want the reader to work hard. Um, there's, you know, oh gosh, I'm going to mess this up. There's the saying, easy reading is terribly hard writing. And, oh, I need to go to the quote investigator. People misattribute this quote con constantly. Uh, okay, well, like people have said different versions of this quote. Some people are like, it was Lord Byron. Some people are like, it's Nathaniel Hawthorne. Some people are like Thomas Hood, which is not. Thomas Hood said easy reading is damned hard writing, which is true. Um, but I like the version without the cuss word because I put it up all over my house. I can't. I can't find it. Uh, oh, well, that's okay. Um, but yes, no. No, no, no. So anyways, that's true. When you're trying to write something that's easy to read, it's really rough on you, but you want it to be rough on you rather than on the reader. So easy reading is terribly hard writing. I have it like printed out upstairs, but I'm downstairs in my office. I'm not going to fix it on this for one more second. Okay. Now we're going to go to topic number six. Uh, what is the worst writing gimmick? And, uh, you know, there are some pretty horrible ones out there. But the one that I absolutely hate with a passion is the writing, the literary gimmick or the writing gimmick of it was all just a dream. No, don't do that. You've wasted my time. Like, give me my money and give me my, you know, however many hours back. Because and, you know, they can't. Well, they won't give you your money back and they won't, they can't give you your time back. So listen, if the thing that's happening to the character isn't working toward real change and like real events in the character's life, I, I don't want it. Like hallucinations, dream sequences. Okay, you can do those in moderation. Do not do it through the whole story. So I want to know though, what is the writing gimmick that you hate the most, that you hate as much as I hate an hour and a half long dream sequence in a movie? <laughs> Comment below and tell me. All right, number seven. How do you distract readers from iffy writing? This question bums me out, you guys. 
because you don't need to do that because you are not going to write with iffy writing. And if you're trying to like trick people into thinking that you're a better writer than you are, you have several problems. One is that you don't have the skills you need to actually be a writer that would warrant someone's time or money. The second could be that you do have the skills, but you lack the confidence and you can adjust that. That's something that you can actively change. And the third is that there's no reason for you to be a, a, a poor writer because I have given you so many resources. You have this podcast or, you know, uh, you have one of my books or you have a ton of free stuff that you can get by going to literarysymmetry.com. Like, the character worksheets that I use, literarysymmetry.com forward slash free. You can get the same exact worksheets that I use for all of my fiction stories and I use with all of my coaching clients for free. And those are going to help move you like way forward in your story. So you don't need distraction. You don't need gimmicky tactics because you can actually write the story of your heart without having to feel like you need to do all of these misdirection tactics that, by the way, readers hate. And actually, it makes them so that they will not trust you ever, ever again in the future. That's how it works. You get one chance with the reader. If you do not prove to them that they can trust you. They're not going to read any of your new stuff. They're going to take that one thing and assume that it is representative of your entire body of work. So you don't want to start off on that kind of footing with the reader who you want to turn into a fan and then a friend. Okay. So you, you don't need that. And also if you're worried about having to distract people. Like I said, my new book, Write Fewer Words, Tell Better Stories is out and you can get it by going to literarysymmetry.com forward slash machine. And it's only $5. It comes with so many good things that includes the audiobook. Like there is no reason for you not to go get this because it will definitely change your writing career. And if you've been with me anytime of all, you know that when I say something, I mean it. And I always, always over deliver. So that's all that I have for you on the show today. Thank you for joining me. Uh, as always, it is never too late to write the story of your heart. Don't follow twice if you want more writing advice and happy writing. Bye.